On the simplest case here of the, of the four that we're thinking about with this caber toss, which is the flight case. In the flight case, it's fairly easy to think about what's happening because there's only one force that's being applied. It's being applied at the center of mass, so it's pretty easy to, to see how the motion is going to take place. Let's um, think about one of the harder cases here, and th this is actually case three, which is what happens when you hit the ground. And part of why I want to focus on this is this actually is a case that requires kind of the before and after type of reasoning that we've used previously with momentum, as opposed to a sort of continuous dynamics type of reasoning. Okay. So the question we're going to ask here is, given some state before the caber hits the ground, what is the state after the caber hits the ground? So in order to do that, the first thing I think is worth doing is to spend a little bit of time just thinking about the picture of things a little bit more explicitly. Okay? So I'm just going to draw a picture to sort of suggest what could happen. Um, and I'm going to suggest a kind of a crazy picture, but only just because it makes life a little bit simpler to think about. So let's imagine that this um, caber, first of all, is rotating in a, let's say it's rotating clockwise pretty quickly and it also is moving downward, right? Well, what's gonna happen when that caber hits the ground? Well, one of the things that you can see is if that's rotating fast enough, actually when it hits the ground, it would actually be digging into the ground in this sort of clockwise direction. So you can sort of imagine it hitting the ground and sort of digging in, right? Something like that, right? So it actually digs in this way. And clearly, if it were spinning in the other direction, it might dig in in the other direction. But this digging into the ground is actually going to happen pretty quickly, and it's going to end at the point when this actual end of the caber becomes stationary. Right? So there'll be a lot of strong interaction that goes on over a very short time scale until the end of the caber is stationary. So if we think about what the interactions are for that, one of the things that's going to happen is the ground is going to be pushing back up quite a bit, so there'll be a large normal force that's being exerted. And the other is the ground is going to resist being dug into, and so that will represent as some kind of frictional force. Obviously, the frictional force could be forward or could be backward, depending on what the direction of the spin and how fast the cable is moving. <coughs> OK, so that's kind of qualitatively what the forces look like. But notice that we don't know actually how big those forces are. Those are constraint forces. They're however big they need to be. And in particular, they're going to be quite large over quite a short time scale. So in order to get somewhere on this, instead of trying to think about what the differential equations are, we're instead going to imagine this is instantaneous and use a kind of before and after framing. Okay. So if we think about what's going on before, um, before it's moving through the air, so it's moving unencumbered. Unencumbered. Um, that means that this point at the tip is moving, so the velocity of the tip is not zero, right? It's some value that's moving. And after this interaction has taken place, um, what's actually going on is you've fixed this point at the end of the of the caber. That point has now become sort of a pivot. So at that point v tip becomes zero, right? In getting from before to after, what's happened is some very strong interactions. There's a strong normal force and also a strong frictional force. And when I say strong, I mean simply that it's a big, not that it's a nuclear force. Um, in other words, there is both a frictional and a normal impulse, right? So I'm going to call those j sub n as the normal impulse. I'll use J because I is already being used for a moment of inertia. Notice that the normal impulse will be in the J hat direction, and J sub script F will be the frictional impulse. In the I hat direction. Okay? We don't know what these two things are. And in order to actually figure out what the final state of the system is, given the initial state, we actually need to figure out these. So our objective here, or our game plan is that given the initial um, x position and velocity, the initial y velocity, the initial um, 
angular velocity, we want to find first what these impulses are in order to find what the final state variables are of the system. All right. At which point we would actually be able to start to assess how the system would evolve after this impact with the ground. Okay, so well, our game plan in order to do that, right, if we're going from this to this, is that if we can think about conservation of momentum and conservation of angular momentum, we might actually be able to apply the fact that the tip velocity is zero at the end, while it's not at the beginning, in order to figure out what these state variables, how these final state variables depend on the initial state variables. Okay, so that's what the sort of overall structure is here. Okay. Let's think about what that means from a conservation perspective. Well, first of all, let's write out an expression for the tip velocities. So V tip, right? In general, V tip is going to be whatever the velocity of the center of mass is. So if I think about positions, right, the position of the tip, right, is going to be the position of the center of mass. And then if I say this is the r hat direction and this is the theta hat direction, it will be the position of the center of mass minus L on 2 times r hat, right? So I'll go up to the center of mass and then down to there in order to get this position r tip. Okay. That means the velocity of the tip is simply going to be the velocity of the center of mass, right? Minus L on 2 times theta dot times theta hat. And that will be true before and true after. Obviously, before it'll be our center mass will be x dot initial i hat plus y dot initial j hat, and after our center mass will be x dot final i hat y dot final j hat. Okay. Um, let's now think about momentum a little bit. So my initial momentum, of course, is the mass of the system, right? The mass of the caber times the initial velocity of the center of mass. Right. My final momentum is of course going to be the mass of the caber times the final velocity, but it also is going to be the same thing as the initial momentum plus whatever impulses are applied, right? Because the impulses give me a change in momentum. So this will be plus the normal impulse plus the frictional impulse. And note that I can write this now in terms of the initial state variable, so I could figure put in x hat, x dot, and y dot in here and write, write at least this part in terms of what the state variables are. Still don't know what j sub n and j sub f are. Okay. By the same token, I can also think about what my angular momentum is. And in order to think about the angular momentum, let's think about what coordinate system it makes sense to use. I'm going to propose we actually use the end of the caber as the coordinate system at the point when it hits the ground. The reason for that is that that's actually going to make it a lot easier to think about torques because there really won't be any torques during this instant if I choose that point. So if that's what I choose as my initial, uh, as my origin, my initial angular momentum about that is going to be, first of all, um, plus L on 2 times R hat crossed with the momentum of the center mass, right? That's the translational component of the angular momentum about this point. Um, and then I also need to add on to that whatever the moment of inertia is about the center of mass times theta dot initial. So that's what my initial angular momentum is. My final angular momentum. Well, if I think about my final angular momentum, I'm actually pinned here. And so I actually could think about it as purely a rotational angular momentum. So that would be moment of inertia about the end times theta final dot. Okay. Now you'll note that if you think about the initial momentum and the angular momentum and the final angular momentum, you could ask the question, how much does the angular momentum change? I mean, the initial angular linear momentum changed due to these two impulses. But since I've chosen this as my origin, you can see that neither of those impulses actually apply a torque impulse. And since neither of those impulses apply a torque impulse, the final angular momentum will actually be the same as the initial angular momentum. 
So this will be the same as L on to R hat cross P center mass initial plus I center mass theta initial dot. That's in the K hat direction. Sorry, I was a little sloppy here. I didn't remember my K hats. Okay, so at this point, I could write my final linear momentum in terms of the impulses and the initial linear momentum. I also can write my final angular momentum in terms of the initial state. And in fact, the, the final angular momentum doesn't depend on what the impulses are for this choice of origin. So now we want to think about how do we actually find these impulses. You remember our game plan was if we know what these initial states are, can we find the impulses in order to figure out what the final state variables are?